Today we begin a new series of messages entitled Foreshadowings. And I'd like to, to begin with a, a story before we take a moment for prayer. This past week, I had the opportunity to hear the testimony from a native-born Israeli, a Jewish man who came to know Jesus as the Messiah without ever reading the New Testament. It's a fascinating story, and here in a nutshell is what he had to say. He said when he was a, a young soldier, young recruit in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, he uh, found himself away from home, away from so many of his friends and family, and uh, as a result did what many young people do when they are driven away from family, friends, and, and comfortable surroundings. He started opening the Bible. And of course, being Jewish, he opened the Hebrew Scriptures, read them in Hebrew, and he found those scriptures speaking to his heart in some very powerful ways. But then he came to the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he read a section of Isaiah that he had never heard in the synagogue. It's Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by man, it says. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The very chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And the young man said at that moment, at that very instant, he realized Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. He had never read a New Testament, had in fact, as he described it, he thought about the New Testament in this way. He felt the New Testament was a non-Jewish book written by non-Jewish people for non-Jewish people who wanted to start a non-Jewish religion. <laughs> After encountering Jesus the Messiah in Hebrew scriptures, he, uh, he went out secretly and found a New Testament, took it with him in his tank, hid it in his uniform, when the other guys were out working on the tracks and doing other work, he would open the New Testament in the, inside the turret, let in a little bit of light, and read it. He said he couldn't believe what he was reading. It was a Jewish book written by Jewish people about a Jewish Messiah. And he said, all of a sudden, the scriptures he had been reading, the Hebrew scriptures, took on new meaning because they all find their fulfillment in Yeshua, in Jesus. And he was there in the Old Testament all along. Today, we are going to start a series of messages entitled Foreshadowings. We're going to do this for a number of weeks now. Foreshadowings. I, uh, I was led to look up that word online this week. I checked it out in the dictionary, and you know, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I still use the dictionary. But this week after finishing the uh, preparation for this message, I just sensed I really ought to look online and see how the, uh, the dictionaries online today define foreshadowing. I'm so glad I did. Listen to this. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is a literary device in which a writer gives an advance hint of what is to come later in the story. You know, the Bible was written by tens of people in various and sundry ages over a period of 1,500 years, but it ultimately has one author, and that is the living God himself. And in his word, he has given us constant, repetitious foreshadowings of Jesus the Messiah, long before he came, we can see him on the pages of Scripture in words written by Moses and Isaiah, by David and by Hosea and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Habakkuk and the list goes on. We're going to be looking at some foreshadowings. Some of them, I'm guessing, will be familiar to a number of you. I'm also guessing some of them will take you completely by surprise. But whatever the case, I believe we are going to see some amazing things from God in these coming weeks. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then let's take a look 
at the first foreshadowing in this series. Not the first foreshadowing in the Bible, but the first foreshadowing in this series. Would you join with me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, how we praise your glorious name. We exalt you and glorify you because you are the creator of the universe. You are God over all, and you are also so near to all who call upon you. We thank you that throughout the scriptures, generation after generation, in every age and in every time, you have given glimpses of yourself, glimpses of the goodness of God, glimpses of our Lord Jesus Christ, even before he came in fulfillment of the prophetic word, we can see throughout the scriptures things that point so directly to him. We pray, Father, that today you would speak into each one of our hearts. We pray that you would open our minds to understand the scriptures, even as Jesus did that with his early disciples. We pray now, Lord Jesus, that by your Holy Spirit, you will open our minds to understand the word, to apply it to life, and to see you in everything. It's in your holy name, Lord Jesus, we come to the Father, and it is with absolute confidence we say, amen, amen, because our God is a faithful king. He really is. Well, I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis, first book of the scriptures, Genesis chapter 22. We're going to be taking a look this morning at one of the most remarkable accounts in all of the Old Testament, and, and also one of the most controversial. I, I'll just be real up front right off the bat. There are many people who look at this story in Genesis 22, the account of Abraham and his son Isaac. There are many in our culture today who say this is divine child abuse. It is nothing of the sort. It is instead one of the most powerful indicators of what the Lord Jesus would do for us and did do for us. And so this morning, we are going to take a look at this amazing and incredible account, an amazing foreshadowing of the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. If you'd open your Bibles and turn now to Genesis chapter 22, I am going to begin at verse 1 where we read the following. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. And that is the way this remarkable account begins. It took place about 4,000 years ago. Abraham is described in the scriptures as the father of all who believe, both Jewish people and non-Jewish people. Abraham was the one whom God told to leave his home, leave everything behind, and go to the land that God would show you. Abraham came from a family that was a family of idolaters, but he came to know the living God, and God appeared to him and spoke to him, and Abraham was transformed and changed. God told Abraham that he and his wife, Sarah, would have a son, and that through that son, through that son's lineage, all nations would be blessed. Abraham was told that God would do incredible things, and Abraham believed God, and the scripture says it was accounted to him as righteousness. And then Abraham waited, and waited, and waited. And what God had promised didn't come to pass. So Abraham and Sarah took matters into their own hands, and that's another story. But finally, God delivered. 25 years after God had made the promise to Abraham, Abraham and Sarah had a child, Isaac. The name means laughter, <laughs> because they laughed with joy at what God had done. And Isaac was precious to them. Their life revolved around him. God had shown himself faithful. And then, as we read the account in the book of Genesis, God was quiet for years. Until one day, the loving creator, the God of Abraham and Isaac, said 
what appeared to be unthinkable. Abraham, God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and offer him up as a sacrifice in the region of Moriah at a place I will show you. It seemed so unlike the living God. That's the things the pagans would do. Those are the kinds of things that false deities demanded. That's what the devil looks for, killing your own children. And Abraham heard the voice of God. But the book of Hebrews tells us Abraham believed God and believed that God could even raise his son from the dead. And so Abraham obeyed. Now, I'd like to pause for just a second and reflect on these words, these opening words from Genesis 22. You know, there is a principle known as the principle of first usage. And the principle goes like this. When a word, a significant word, appears for the first time in the book of Genesis, it often sets the stage for every usage of that word that follows. The way that word is first used often determines the way it is used in the rest of the Bible. And there are some amazing first words here in Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 2, is the first time we read the word love in the Hebrew Bible or in the English Bible. Take your only son whom you love Isn't it interesting that love is connected with an only son? Now, some may say, well, that's just coincidental. And if you're feeling that way right now, I would ask you to hang in there for a second because you are going to be bombarded with so many coincidences that I believe in the end what you're going to say is, I don't think those are coincidences at all. And I would remind you, The word coincidence never appears in the pages of scripture. (laughs) Anyway, God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah to a place I will show you. And Abraham does that. In fact, this is what the scriptures say. Genesis 22, verse 3, early the next morning. Note, Abraham does not dawdle. He doesn't say, well, I think I'll I'll wait a couple of days. Maybe God will change his mind. No, Abraham does what God says. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham obeys God. He travels from the area around Beersheba in the Negev up along the, uh, the mountainous ridge that goes through the heart of Israel, past Hebron to Moriah. I, I googled that this past week. It's 44 miles as the crow flies from Beersheba to Moriah. 44 miles as the crow flies. But Abraham was not a crow. And Abraham had to walk. And it's a bit longer when you take the paths and the roads. Anyway, he did that for three days. Listen to this. This is another one of those remarkable coincidences. On the third day, verse 4, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Think about that for a moment. On the third day, Abraham has taken his only son whom he loves. And for three days, in Abraham's mind, Isaac is as good as dead. And on the third day, on the third day, they get to the place the place of sacrifice. This is what we read. Verse five, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Now think about that for just a second. 
Abraham takes the wood, the wood for the burnt offering, and places it on his son. Isaac carries the wood on his shoulders up the mountain. And as they are walking together, they reflect on what has just gone on. Abraham has told the two servants that he and the boy are going to go up there to worship. It's the first time that word appears in the scriptures as well. What is true worship? True worship revolves around a father who is willing to sacrifice his only son whom he loves. And as the son carries the wood on his shoulder, he says, Father, we've got the wood, we've got the fire. Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham says prophetically, God himself will provide the lamb. Now, many times, for those of us who've grown up with Bible stories as kids, we have this picture of Isaac being a little boy, maybe five, six years old. That is not what the Hebrew implies. In fact, the Hebrew word that is translated boy can refer to an individual who is a young adult, late teens, early 20s. It's the same word that is used for the two servants who accompany Abraham and Isaac. In fact, the Jewish rabbis believed that Isaac at this time was 37 years old. (laughs) Wow is right. You know why they believe that? Because when we get to the end of chapter 22 and begin chapter 23, we are given a a chronological information. And the information is about Sarah, who dies at the age of 137. 127, rather. And so the rabbi said, well, Sarah must have died shortly after this event. And therefore, since Sarah was 90 when the boy was born, he was 37 at this point. The fact of the matter is, we know Abraham was well over 100. And let's face it, a teenager or someone in their early 20s, they can, they can out arm wrestle any 100 plus old guy. But the son goes willingly, and he walks up the mountain willingly. And then we read these words, powerful words. When they reached the place, verse 9, God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I'd like to step back for a moment and reflect on some amazing coincidences that are no coincidences at all. In fact, what we're going to look at very quickly here are seven such amazing things. They're not the only ones, but they're powerful ones. And here they are, number one, the father offers up his beloved only son. These words were written down by Moses 1400 years before the coming of Jesus. But already God, who is the ultimate author of Scripture, is saying that genuine love is best shown in a father who is willing to offer up his only beloved son. A second truth. The son was as good as dead for three days. In Abraham's mind, his boy was gone. But Abraham trusted God. And in the same way, The Lord Jesus was laid in the tomb, dead for three days, but then raised 
by the power of the Father and the Spirit. Number three, worship and sacrifice on Mount Moriah. That's where God told Abraham to go. We know from the book of 2 Chronicles that Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. And it is the site where the temple was built. And so what we see here is 400 years before God had even designated that site as the place for worship. Abraham and Isaac go there to worship the living God. And the sacrifice is made in the heart of what would become the city where Jesus died. Number four, the father and son act in unity. It's true. The son was obedient to the father's will. Isaac did what Abraham said. Isaac went where the father told him. Isaac did not resist. He did not put up a fight. He simply laid down his life in obedience. (laughs) Number five, the son actually carried the wood. You cannot read that without thinking of Jesus carrying his own cross as he goes out to Calvary, to Golgotha, the place where he would be offered up. Number six, Abraham spoke prophetic words. God himself will provide a lamb. And that is exactly what God did. This is a foreshadowing of the real lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was the first one to proclaim that directly of Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul would say, Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And we first get a glimpse of that here, Genesis 22. And finally, point number seven, the son goes willingly. No fighting, no objections, No, could we do this another way? In the garden, Jesus said, Father, if there's some other way, but your will be done. And we already see that here. Now, looking at this, it is so clear, such a beautiful picture of what was to come, a true foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. But there is more. (laughs) Dare I say that? There is much more. You see, the first time love is used in the Bible is in Genesis 22, and it has to do with the love of a father for his only son. But do you know the first time the word love is used in the New Testament? First time it's used in each one of the Gospels. It's rather fascinating. First time love is used in the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew 3.17 where the father speaks from heaven and says, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. The first time the word love appears in the gospel of Mark is in Mark chapter one, verse 11. And the father speaks from heaven and says, you are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. And the first time love appears in the gospel of Luke is in Luke chapter three, verse 22. When the father says, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. You want to guess what the first time the word love, when the first time the word love is used in the gospel of John? You got it. John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. The ultimate author of the scriptures is the God of the universe. And he is boldly declaring time and time again the truth that he loves the world desperately. That he loves you and me so much he would not spare his only son. God chose Abraham to be the one through whom the seed of Messiah would come. 
But God did not subject Abraham to the horrific loss that God himself endured for us. The measure of the Father's love is that he will spare no expense to bring you and me back to him. You see, God's love for us is not conditioned on how nice we are, on how good we look, on how faithful we have been or effective we've been or successful we've been or the list goes on. God's love for you and me is unconditional. It is why the scripture says he desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Sin destroys. We are living in a world that is living proof of the destructive power of rebellion against God. But Jesus is the living proof of the forgiving love of the heavenly father. The risen Jesus is the one who can speak to you and me and say, I have come that you may have life and have it in all abundance. That is what God offers. And he gives us not only that clear truth in the New Testament, but he gives us dramatic foreshadowings of it in the old. Everything points to him. And nothing is more important than knowing him. It's just that simple. As we look at the Bible, we see remarkable truths and amazing foreshadowings of him who is the way and the truth and the life. And it is there for a purpose. It testifies to the faithfulness of God and it calls you and me to repentance and faith. When we understand how much God loves us, when you and I come to grips with the fact that the almighty creator of the universe was willing to condemn his own son so that you and I might live forever, what that produces in us is a change of heart and a change of mind and a change of direction. What it does is offers life. And no matter what you may have done in your life, no matter how you may have failed, God wants you and he wants you desperately. And all through the pages of his word, he gives dramatic foreshadowings of that incredible truth. The purpose of foreshadowing is to reveal the author's intent. And the intent of the heavenly father is that you and I know him and experience life with him forever. And that life is found in Jesus, the only son whom he loves, who gave his life for us all, who's risen from the grave, ascended to the father's side and is coming back and coming soon. And we do not want to miss that. Trust me, when he returns, no one will miss that. <laughs> but you don't want to miss what he has to offer. It's just that simple. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I would like to suggest this morning is a real good time to do that. Let's come before him right now in prayer. Let's offer ourselves to him. If you are a person who is just coming to faith, today is a good day to speak before the Lord and say, I believe in you and Lord Jesus, I receive you as my savior. If you're one who already knows him, Today is a good day to recommit our hearts and lives and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you and I thank you. I believe in you with all my heart. Let's do that right now. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your goodness in Jesus, our Savior. We thank you that you love this world so much that you didn't spare your only son, but you gave him up for us all. And so this morning, we admit to you, I admit to you, I am a sinner. I need a savior. If that is what you also know and believe, would you say that I am a sinner and I need a savior? I am a sinner and I need a savior. 
And today, Lord Jesus, I commit my life to you because you have died for me and risen for me and are coming back for me. Because you have paid the full price for my sin, I confess you as my Savior and Lord, and I surrender my life to you. If that is what you believe, if that is what is on your heart, would you please say, I confess you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. I confess you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. And here is what God says to us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. That's his pledge. He is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Well, fascinating account from Genesis 22, isn't it? I mean, amazing words foreshadowing an author's means by which he, which he indicates how the story is going to end. Next week, we're going to take a look at another foreshadowing. It too is a somewhat familiar story, but many times people miss the foreshadowings in the most familiar of stories. Stay tuned, okay? In the meantime, would like to encourage you not to just simply uh, let this message sort of be uh, taken to the, the back burner of your life. I, I'd encourage you to give some thought about this and, and think specifically. Is there someone whom God has placed on my heart or on your heart who would really profit from what was shared in this message? It, it might be someone that, you know, you've been talking with and you realize, wow, you know, I ought to share some of those things with that person. Maybe it's someone you can send a link to. Say, hey, I found this really helpful thought you might. But allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Is there someone whom God places on your heart? And secondly then, pray for him. <laughs> we, we are called to pray for all people. The Bible says pray for kings and for those in authority. Pray for all people. This is good and pleases God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Pray for those who do not yet know him or who are going through some tough times. It may be there's someone in your life who right now just needs to hear a word of comfort and consolation and hope. Pray for them. Hold them up in prayer. <laughs>